I wish someone would have. I wish someone had would have told the story about Joseph. Thank you. Um, so everybody, thank you for coming to this rally. My name is Joan and I'm a local resident in East Somerville. I'm a newer resident compared to some of the speakers who will be speaking after me, but it doesn't take long for someone to realize that there is something very wrong about these streets that surround us. Take a look around you. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of cars driving really fast. We can't really see 93 from here, but it's just one block over there. To be honest, I avoid this corner. I avoid crossing here. I go the long way around to try to avoid this particular intersection. We have 93 in the grab cutting across Somerville and cutting across the people's lives that live here. The stop and shop is just one block away. This is the only grocery store for people in Winter Hill and for the longest time it was the only grocery store for people in Assembly Row and they have to cross this highway in order to get to the grocery store. They do this on days like this and days hotter than this. They do this in the rain and people are dying because of it. Boss Park is right there. Kids play there. If a ball ever flies into this McGrath, that could be pretty deadly. We are missing our school committee here today because they have a budget meeting, but they also want to point out that children walk to school. Young school children are walking across these highways to get to and from school every single day. Uh, we just want to make sure that, oh, sorry. Um, so MassDOT is planning some changes this year. Um, they are going to build a protected bike lane and better sidewalks but it will end before we get to this lot. They are doing nothing over here on this side. And they are working this year to preserve the life of the steel of 93, but not the life of the people who live here. We call on MassDOT to make this area safer for our neighbors by adding anti-pollution and noise barriers and making safer crossings for people trying to get to the grocery store. They do it for other communities in Massachusetts. They should do it for Somerville. If you haven't signed our letter to call on MassDOT for this, uh, please, there are some petitions here. I think people wearing vests are also have some petitions. And if you're able, please attend MassDOT's virtual meetings on June 1st and June 8th, which are next Tuesday and the Tuesday following that, um, from 6 to 8 p.m. Again, there's information about these events on these boards. Um, so, so we have the counselors that represent Winter Hill and East Somerville with us here today. Uh, Jesse Klingon and Matt McLaughlin have been fighting for their residents' safety, and it was actually through my counselor, Matt, that I learned about the lack of particular barriers in Somerville. Um, I invite counselor Matt to come up here and say a few words about the impact of MassDOT's negligence. So I'll be brief. I was told to cut it short. Um, I just want to say that I'm sick and tired of having moments of silence for my constituents. I'm also sick and tired of telling, having to tell people that this is the state. There isn't much I can do about it as a counselor. This is what we're doing. We're here today to tell MassDOT enough's enough. Enough of our constituents have died on your roads that it's time for you to do something. So thank you. All right. Can everybody hear me? I have to speak up so you can hear me over the highway. Uh, it'd be very nice if we could get some sound barriers to address that possibly, or maybe have a traffic calling. Uh, get the roads to be narrow so we don't have a highway cut through our community. My name is uh, Matt McLaughlin on the Ward 1 City Council, which is right here. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, before I even start talking about highways, I want to talk about a phrase that I hear in a lot of progressive circles, a phrase called intersectionality. And it's no better place than the worst intersection in the city to talk about this. This is an intersection where race meets class, meets the economy, meets pedestrian rights, meets environmental rights, meets small business immigrant owners. And all these groups are affected by this highway, which 70 years ago was called uh, cut into our community. I'm getting a phone call now. Uh, <laughs> probably not somebody, unfortunately, complaining about this, because I don't get that many complaints from this side of town about this issue that's really impacting their life. Uh, so this is a very important issue. I want to thank you all for coming out here. Uh, but the question I have is, why has it taken 70 years for us to address this issue? 
the federal and state government cut through our neighborhood, McGrath Highway, I-93. This community is an islet. You have to, you can't leave or come to this community without crossing a highway to come and go, to just get food, to get your basic needs, to go to work. You have to cross a highway to get here. And it's been 70 years, and unfortunately, one of the things I want to say, quite frankly, is lots of times when we talk about intersectionality, we talk about equity, oftentimes people think about the thing that matters to them most, and then fill in the blank and say, well, this is how we make it equity. Oftentimes, equity means focusing on the things that don't impact you directly, that impact people that you may never meet, that you may never see. And I want you all to observe the people crossing the street who may not come to this protest, who are just coming and going. They're people, I very rarely get complaints about traffic issues, about hit and run accidents, about air pollution. We've taken it upon ourselves to address these issues because the people who are affected by this the most this is just one more obstacle in their lives. This is just another thing for them to get through in their everyday life, to get food, to go home, to see their children. Right. They have to cross a highway just to get here. So I'm very happy that you're all here. And I am very optimistic now because what we were missing for the longest time is people power. It's people acknowledging that this is the problem. This is the transit issue in the city. This is the environmental issue in the city. This is the biggest issue when it comes to transit rights, pedestrian rights, environmental rights in the city, and I believe that the people here are the people who are going to be able to make it happen. <clears throat> True equity, I say, is acknowledging the needs of other people, the people who may not be here right now, and they need your voice. And I'll just end on a positive note and just say that, in my experience, government is incredibly responsive. The government will respond to your needs, but when it comes to the people who have the highest needs, you have to yell from the mountaintops, you have to scream, you have to get loud, you have to get angry, and you have to advocate not just for yourself, but for people that you may never meet. And I want to thank you all. I want you to say that this is not going to end today. It's been 70 years we've been dealing with this issue, and it's not going to get solved this week. It's not going to get solved this year. Well, hopefully some of it will. But uh, this is a lifelong commitment. This is a years-long commitment. And I do just want to acknowledge, I see a few people from me, some of them here, most notably Barbara Cassessa. Where are you, Barbara? Barbara Cassessa, can you stand up, Barbara? So 70 years ago, Barbara and her family lied down in front of bulldozers to stop I-93 and McGrath Highway from cutting through this community. And they didn't win that battle because this was the working class community and it's still the working class community in some of them. And we need to carry on the fight that Barbara and people before us made. And we can't, she took her 70 years. It may take a few more years, but we're gonna get it done. I wanna thank everybody for coming and don't let this be your last time. There's many more steps to uh, accomplishing this goal. Thank you. Okay. Two of our neighbors who have lost loved ones on Mass Dot Streets in the last two years are here. Um, I think Hop Mac, if you are still here, I think he, Mac, Hop Mac, are you still here? Please come up here if you're still here. He, uh, okay. Yeah, he, oh. Thank you for joining us. You're gonna have to lean in. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hop Mack and I lived in Somerville for 30 years, over 30 years. We are here today to raise awareness on safety concerns and how, and how unsafe this area is. Not just for pedestrians, but, but for drivers as well. I would like to tell you a little story about my father and family. Marshall Mack served in the Navy for South Vietnam, fighting alongside with the U.S. against communism and was a prisoner of war for six years. After he was released, my dad took his family on a wooden boat to sail to the United States for a chance of freedom. The journey was not easy. It was a struggle for what my dad had to endure. When we got to the U.S., he was finally relieved that his family would have the chance of a better life. Marshall was, is a wonderful, kind, loving father, grandfather, and husband. He didn't have much. He did not care for materialistic things. What he cared most was his children to be successful in life and be happy. He was always there for us, especially for my mother. 
Now it is uh, taking a huge toll on her. When I was younger, every day he would wake me up for school and work. Now every day I ask for him to wake me up from this horrible nightmare. My dad lived in Somerville for 37 years and he loves this community so much. He, he always wants to help everyone open and hold doors for his neighbors with a gentle smile. When he goes to the laundromat, he would help the employees clean while waiting for the clothes to be done. On April 12, 2021, Marshall Mack was on his way home from grocery shopping and was involved in a hit and run. They coward less act and poor judgment by the driver. The hardest day of our lives was April 29 when he passed away. My family and my life has forever changed. The safety for pedestrians and drivers should be focused in this area, from Mystic to McGrath Highway, especially with an active park nearby. A few years back, my wife's parents were also in a car accident at Blakely and McGrath. Thank God they are okay. Safety measures need to be raised for change now and not wait for another tragedy to happen. Please, I ask that this be prioritized for the families of Somerville. That's a, that is what my dad would want. I miss you and I love you, Bob. Rest in peace. about the GoFundMe for Marshall Mack and Hot Mack family. Thank you so much for sharing that really painful story. Next we have Melanie Hockabout, a friend of Cheryl Richards, who also perished in Mass Dot's Corridor of Death. Thank you all for being here. I'm Melanie, a friend of Cheryl Richards. One of the people who lost their life in the McGrath Mystic Ave area. I'm gonna take you back with me to 20, July 20th, 2019. It was hot, much like today. So Cheryl and I wisely headed to the North Shore to join our friend Noel for a beach day. I remember Cheryl inching her way into the water with more than a little coaxing from Noelle and me. No matter how warm the water got, it was never warm enough for Cheryl. Usually she would make it in as far as her knees, but on that day, she, got, she made it all the way up to her waist, which was incredible given how much she hates the cold New England water. So there we were in Sun and Ocean, sharing our stories like my misadventures in kickboxing, Noelle's trials and tribulations of office life, and Cheryl telling us the achievements of her goddaughter, Zaria. Right around this time, I remember Noelle exclaiming, I love July, it's my favorite month. It was a wonderful day. I made my return home first. Next to leave was Cheryl. She had to get back to Somerville to see her friend Tony, whose dad was dying of cancer. So after leaving Sullivan Station, Cheryl went through the underpass towards the stop and shop where she entered the first of two dangerous crosswalks. Nine o'clock, phone rings. It's Jerome, Cheryl's partner. She's in the hospital. I rush there in the darkness. Call Noel. Noel, come, it's bad. At the hospital, I see Jerome sitting alone. He looks ready to shatter into a million pieces. There's a pain here. It's tight and I'm sweating. No answers. We can't see her. Now Noel is here. We are taken to a sad, empty room. What I saw there I had never seen in real life. What happened there was primal. 
When the doctor said the words and the on-scene officer confirmed our worst fears, to my right, Jerome went into an immediate fetal position. To my left, Noelle is crying and holding on to Heather, the only one of us who knew what that room was. And me, I made a deep clamoring cry that was pain. It shot from me to pull at the skirts of time, begging her to bring Cheryl back. So mascot, your inaction is killing us. People should not be risking their lives, dying, and being injured when there is a solution, a plan that can transform a death trap into a safe space where the community and highway can coexist. It is unacceptable to put this off. Work to make this area safe should have been done long ago. What do you do to an, an organization that is so ineffectual that it's killing people? I don't think I'm being harsh to consider it murder. So for those we lost, for those still here, and for those yet to come, Mass Dot, do your job now! We have a Reverend Ben Eshevardaya, um, who is the executive director of the Welcome Project. He'll come up and give a moment of silence. Oh, there you are. If we can just bow our heads and have a moment of silence for all the victims, all the people who have perished because of the highways, all the people who, because of poor air quality, are suffering, living out their lives with pulmonary problems. Let's just take a moment and bow our heads. Thank you. I want to start off with a question to all my electeds. I want to start off asking our congresswoman, or is it doctor now, Ayanna Presley, to the mayor, Joe Curtitone, to our state reps, both um, Erica's here, Mike Connolly and Christine Barber, and to all our city councilors that are here as well. Why does the government hate people who look like me? Why is it that every year I drive down and I have to hear about murders? If you come down 95 South, what do you see? You drive through Medford, you see sound barriers. You see none. You see the mystic housing, you see beautiful little apartments and everything. And then the second you see a sign that says enter in Charlestown, boom, another sound wall. The only time, and I sit there and I say this because then when I sit in my office, which literally looks across the street from the mystics and looks over the highway, the only neighborhood that has one is an affluent white community known as Ten Hills. Why is it that communities, that people who live in these communities who look like me are the people who have to cross these streets dangerously all the time, who are the ones who have quarter, who have heart problems, who have asthma, who now new research is showing has dementia because of the pollution that we're breathing in from the highways and the roads that come down. Let's not forget one other thing. As they talk about doing, quote unquote, repairs to the aqueducts, they want to, they want to put traffic on Mystic Ave. So they want to bring the traffic closer to everybody else late at night. So now we're being polluted by the air that we're breathing in even more so. Why is it that we continually have to beg and plead? And then, of course, what will happen? We will hear MassDOT will try to make concessions. They're not talking about giving us sound walls. They're not talking about thinking about our air, our air quality. Instead, what they want to do is say, once again, wait in line. Next time we do something, we'll build something. Next time we do something, we'll build something. It's always the same story, next time. When we, when we wanted to fight and we wanted other things, next time we build. When we ask for road repairs, what did they say? Next time. We're tired. We're dying. It's time to stop today. 
We don't need next time. We need now. And I'm so glad that to hear so many of my elected people and to see so many of them here willing to fight because I'm tired of having to say, my people are dying. Those who look like me are dying. And it's time we do something about it. I'm glad we're hearing the message. It's amazing to see so many people come out. And I'm proud of everyone who's here because together we can make a change. It's interesting. We think about this in a larger context. Our river, the Mystic, the Mystic Lake, if you go upstream, it's beaches in Arlington. Here, we can, barely canoe, we can barely canoe or row on it because it's still polluted. Our streets definitely need fixing. We've seen this over and over again. I, don't, I can even tell you the story where literally, as they were painting the new, the new, inter, the new intersection over there, where they were putting nice little lines and everything else, and I'm trying to cross the street, a cop literally had to pull a car over because as I'm on the crosswalk, he's inching into the crosswalk, waiting, and the cop's yelling at him, saying, stop, 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 and he wouldn't, so he had to pull him over and finally give him a ticket. We're tired of it. I won't even talk about my friends who, who are impaired, who have disabilities and how they cannot even walk on these streets because they're not designed for them. I won't talk about the winters where they, where they forget to plow, where they forget to do anything, so you have to walk on these streets, let alone the sidewalks, which is only putting you in more danger. This is a long fight. And together we can make that fight happen. And what I need is for people to sign those petitions. What I need is for my electeds to not just say it's time to do something, but to yell it. To yell it at Baker, to yell it at Mastot, to yell it even at, to, actually even Biden, I, I have a congresswoman here. To yell it at Biden during the infrastructure projects. <laughs> to sit there and say, these are projects that need to be done. Time we finish what we started 70 years ago and make our streets just. And it's not just about us. Because you know what? When we look at California, they don't allow you to build so close to the highways as we do here. When, we, when California talks about building, they actually think about equity. Whereas here, it's like, we can throw affordable housing just right next to the highway. Great. But we'll put the nice condos next to the train that's coming in. We need to fight, people. This is the beginning not the end. Stay strong and stay in the struggle. So one of the things that I do want to introduce now is Stefan Anman. Stephenson is the former Mystic Resident Tenant Association president. He and I many times have fought hard for just improvements around the Mystic, the Mystic developments. So, Stephenson, if you can come up, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to see so many people out here today because this is a very important situation that they have to speak about. They told me to speak about my experience, speak for the little people. And that's the problem. They see us as little people. We are citizens of this city, and we love some of them. And it's unfortunate that they took the time to not do anything for us. It's unbelievable the amount of people that we have lost. From Kevin Dumont, Cheryl Richards, Marshall Mack. These individuals did not need to die because of the quality of the roads. We have great, great people here in some of them. Great minds. And we can come together and correct this mistake. But it takes us all, not just today, coming together. It's going to take a process, but we need everybody to be cooperative and focused on trying to get this situated. The sound barriers on 93 would be nice, but that's a part of it. Trying to get this, um, um, the traffic slowed down a little bit would be nice, but that would be part of it. Keeping people alive should be our main focus. Yes, yes, sir. yes sir. Like Ben has spoke, it is good to see so many electors out here today because our officials, people that we put into office, are the individuals that are going to make a difference for us. So it makes me proud to see all the people out here. But it also makes me proud to see the citizens out here, people that care, the voices that need to be spoken up. And we will speak up. Thank you. I want to introduce a resident 
I'm proud because she's actually one of my kids at the Welcome Project, where, you know, we try to build the future leaders, and this is definitely a future leader. Actually, this is a leader now in the Mystics. So I want to introduce Angie Mejia. Angie, please come up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Angie. I was a former Lyft student. I was at the former Lyft student. Okay, I'm starting all over. <laughs> um, hi, guys. My name is Angie. I was a former Lyft student at the Welcome Project. I live near the Mystic. Um, I actually live in the Mystic Projects. Um, as many as you know, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, actually, the police station of Somerville posted about a shooting in the project where thankfully no one was hurt. You may ask why I'm talking about this and how does this relate to this rally. Well, the truth is, is it doesn't, but this is the truth of what I'm going to say. This is an issue that can be fixed. Some issues sometimes are out of our hands, and sadly we can't fix everything in this world, even though I think a lot of us would. When I was uh, going to summer school classes a few years, a few years ago at the East Somerville, um, my mom always was told me, hey, be careful with the street right there. That was her most concern. And I walked all the way from the projects down here and her concern was that street. I've had cousins, nephews, nieces, and friends walk across that street. And after crossing it a few times, and although I did use, you know, the crosswalk, I understood her worry. Um, this is not just a one-sided issue. It affects people who walk. It affects the drivers as well. Because if the pavement isn't shown well, a driver won't stop on time. A driver won't be able to see the, the pedestrian. And the... <laughs> Um, so back to what I was saying, it, we have to create a safe space for the pedestrian and the drivers as well. Along with this, we also have to address the reconstruction of the I-93 and the pollution and the sound it will bring. Just as right now, the highway brings a lot of noise, especially when trucks and loud cars pass by. It also brings a lot of pollution to the air. If the traffic is directed to the Mystic Avenue, many people will be affected and they will not be able to sleep at night. Not only are you talking about pe affecting people's jobs, the students that will be going to school, but you also think about the fact that it, this will affect their health. Many of them may be drivers and if they're sleepy on their way to work, they can cause accidents. Just like anything, this has to be an issue for everybody to think about and actually address. Thank you. Up next is Emily Vidas. She lives on Mystic Ave. She is a member of Somerville's Pedestrian and Transportation Advisory Committee, and she's a mother of two children who go to the Healy School. So I've been thinking a lot about what to say today, and, and it's hard because I'm so angry. I'm, I'm furious every time, every time I have to cross Mystic Ave. It, the indignity, I, I don't know if you know what it feels like every time you have to go to the supermarket to think that you might die, that if you have one moment of, ina of inattention, you could die. And that's, that's, you know, today we took a walk with, uh, with elected officials in the press, and they were flabbergasted. But it's just Wednesday for me. I'm, I'm so angry that I have to choose to keep my windows open on a beautiful spring night, or, and, and have the noise, or keep them closed and put the air conditioner on. I'm so furious that after three deaths in two years, MassDOT has done nothing for us, nothing. And only, they've made cosmetic changes. I don't know if you've noticed, but the crosswalks have been freshly painted. That's because Ayanna Presley is here today. And because they knew all of you were coming. Not because we needed them. We've been asking for years for these things to be fixed. But they did it because of this rally. But even though I'm so angry, I'm also quite hopeful. Because all of you are here. And because they have started to make changes. 
And if we can keep the pressure up, maybe we can get them to do changes that are more than superficial. So please come to the virtual meetings on June 1st and June 8th. Please show your faces and make noise, because that's how we'll change. Demand change. Thank you. I have another job here, sorry. I'm supposed to introduce the state delegation, which is Mike Connolly, Christine Barber, Erica Eidenhoven, and Pat Jalen, who can't be here, she's at another meeting, but the three are the state delegation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Christine Barber, state representative um, for part of this area that we just walked. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Hop Mac and Melanie for sharing your immense pain with this group. Um, and it's, it's pain, it's something that should never have happened. And I hope that, you know, by being here, by energizing this group, we can ensure that it never happens to anyone else. So thank you so much for sharing that. So my district is um, the Mystics, Mystic Ave, um, that many of us walked before this rally. And as we've heard from so many great speakers, um, that is an area where my constituents, my community, they risk their lives every day to go to the grocery store or to get across the street to take the bus to school um, or to work. And even beyond that, the hundreds of families who live on Mystic Ave are breathing in the pollution from I-93 every day that's greatly affecting their health, and we have the science uh, behind that. But there is something we can do. This harm has been done to this community, and it can be undone. So working with Senator Jalen, with Rep. Connolly, Rep. Idahoven, we've secured money in a bond bill, $2 million. It's a start, it's not enough, but we've secured money for pedestrian improvements. We've secured another $2 million for sound barriers. Again, it's a start. We've secured that money, but MassDOT needs to spend it. The Baker administration needs to spend it, and that is not happening yet. We need to make enough noise that the Baker administration hears that and spends that money and make sure that these incredibly urgent improvements happen now. So I'm going to need you to show up on June 1st and June 8th and make that ask um, because we need, we have that money available and we need it to be spent here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rep. Barber. Uh, my name is Mike Conley. I have the honor of representing uh, this part of Somerville, the 26th Middlesex District. And it's so wonderful to see all of you here because our legislative delegation, in partnership with city officials from the city of Somerville, we've been fighting for every inch of progress that we can make with MassDOT. And I'm gonna run you through a couple of the things we've done. But as you've heard, alone we can't do it. We need each and every one of you to show up on June 1st, for the Boston area capital investment meeting, and on June 8th for the I-93 viaduct preservation meeting. I attended my first meeting regarding the deadly conditions on McGrath Highway all the way back in the year 2012. It was organized by the Livable Streets Alliance. And then when I was elected in 2017, one of my first things that I did when I got into office was I brought MassDOT officials right to the Kensington underpass. Mayor Curta Tony was with us. Council of President McLaughlin was with us. Senator Jalen was with us. Many of you here came with us. We brought MassDOT right to that deadly intersection and we said, you need to address this. We brought MassDOT to the state's abs in East Somerville and we showed them how triple deckers are literally abutting the interstate. And as you heard Ben Echevarria say, if you go to the wealthier communities, if you go to the whiter communities, they have beautiful sound walls protecting against that ultra-fine particulate matter. I went to visit my mom in Norwood. I drove up in the Mass Pike. I took a left at 128. There are 30-foot sound walls protecting the woods. They're protecting the trees. This is an environmental justice community. It's called an environmental justice community because of its diversity, because of its socioeconomic status, and because of its immigrant population. Why is it that MassDOT and the Baker administration will protect the lives of the trees in Needham, 
and they won't protect the lives of our constituents. So Aaron, we know, thanks to the work that the Centerville Transportation Equity Partnership has done, it has been documented that that ultra-fine particulate matter is causing cardiovascular disease. And when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, you can overlay the map of the highway pollution, and you can look at the COVID-19 map, and it looks like exactly the same map. So following that 2017 meeting, working with our delegation, we were able to secure funding in successive budgets to improve the Kensington underpass, to begin to measure, at least start to measure, the sound pollution on the highway. Then in 2019, tragedy struck yet again when we lost Cheryl Richards. That very same week, I had a meeting with Secretary Pollack, and I asked her to respond, and she promised us they would accelerate a road safety audit that they're doing in this area. Then in 2020, December 2020, MassDOT met with our community, and they told us we will have a 75% design meeting in April of this year, and we will begin construction on a $6 million intersection improvement project in the summer of 2022. I thought it could happen a little faster. I thought we needed to do a little more, but at least that was something. And so I can't tell you how shocked I was, how shocked all of us were, when last month MassDOT called our delegation together and they said, by the way, that intersection improvement project is being delayed for another year, and oh yeah, we are 100% through design of an I-93 viaduct preservation project. And they told me, and this is when I lost it, they said the goal of the project is to preserve the life of the steel on the highway bridge. And I immediately shot back, if you're going to preserve the life of the steel, you need to take action to preserve the lives of our constituents. So, I'll stop there. If you haven't figured out already, I would talk about this until the sun goes down and until it comes up again tomorrow morning. I want to hear from our mayor and our congresswoman, but I also want you to know Senator Jalen right now is in the Senate budget process. She's fighting to have this addressed in the Senate process. And the most important thing, the most important thing that I ask that we all take away from this is participate in that June 1 meeting and the public comment process that follows it, and participate in that June 8th meeting and the public comment process that follows that. As Rep. Barber said, we have actually secured the funding to address this problem. We have done that in the transportation bond bill. We did that in the housing and community development bond bill. All we need now is for MassDOT to move forward with the work that we've already lined up for them. So thank you for being here. This gives us hope. And so I have to tell you, this, this is truly the honor of a lifetime. I have been so grateful for the work that our Congresswoman has done. I have never been prouder of an elected official in my life. And not only has Rick Presley done it all in Washington, D.C., but she goes the extra mile and she will speak up on a state issue. She will speak up on a local issue, whether it's the Roe Act, whether it's the Student Opportunity Act, whether it's criminal justice reform. And when she uses her voice, it makes a difference. So I am so grateful to introduce our Congresswoman, Ayanna Presley. All right, y'all, I need to say this. You know, I am, uh, uh, the granddaughter of a Baptist preacher. I have a, a strong opinions and a strength of conviction and I don't suffer for what to say very often. But note to self, never follow a Somerville elected or activist. <laughs> 
So all I can really say is hard cosign uh, everything that has been enumerated uh, by my colleagues in government. I thank them for their fierce advocacy and for their partnership. You know, um, as a black woman, I'm often told that I need to moderate my righteous indignation or rage lest people think I'm angry. <laughs> Well, I am outraged because this is outrageous. And justice delayed <laughs> is justice denied. And these are not statistics. These are people of flesh and bone who loved and were loved. This is sacred ground. So we speak their names. Kevin. Cheryl. Marshall, for those whose lives we've been robbed of violently and those who are slowly dying because of the environmental injustices. This is a transit justice issue. This is an environmental justice issue. This is a disability justice issue. This is a pedestrian justice issue. This is a matter of justice. And justice has been denied because it has been delayed. And the reason we are here today is because of the vigilance of the Welcome Project, of SAS, of my siblings in movement building and justice seeking on the municipal and state level, which proves that organized power is realized power. We're still here, we're at this moment, because you have labored in love, because you give a damn about your neighbor and our communities. And so I thank you for that. The other reason why this is so infuriating is that the lives of Kevin and Cheryl and Marshall that we were robbed of due to traffic violence, a violence that has been perpetuated by indifference, a complicit, passive tolerance. So this was 100% preventable. That is the point. Like most inequities and disparities and injustices, they don't just happen. They happen because of indifference. They happen because of underinvestment or divestment. They happen because of policy choices, because of budget choices. These tragedies were 100% preventable. And that's why I'll continue to fight for direct federal funding for McGrath Highway and our surface transportation reauthorization negotiations that are currently underway with the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. And we have to... Wait a second, alopecia problems. Mr. Mayor, can I get a Somerville hat or something? Next time. Well, I'm gone. Okay, very good. But we have to keep the pressure up. You know, McGrath Highway has consistently been ranked as one of the most dangerous roads based on the data, the data that is about real lives, and the investments that have been made that Representative Connolly uh, spoke to and were referenced by some activists earlier have only come about because of the pressure that you all have applied. And so we cannot let up. We have to continue to apply this pressure. Now I want to take a moment of uh, my good colleague, the city council, uh, Councilor Matt, spoke of intersectionality. Our destinies are tied. And sadly, injustice and oppression of the minoritized and marginalized is usually intersectional. So we have to take a moment to speak to the intersectionality of our organizing and in our future, not just for this corridor, but for the thousands like it throughout the country. It is a 
important to recognize the long and ugly history that most interstate highway projects have created, including the I-93 project. Now, while the Inner Belt Project, which would have redirected I-93 right through the heart of Boston, splitting Roxbury and other communities in half, was effectively defeated by public outcry in the 1970s, again, organized power is realized power, and the power of the people has always been greater than the people in power, and that's why we don't stop. is still presenting environmental hazards for surrounding communities. I represent the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District. Do you think that I am surprised representing Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Randolph, Everett, Chelsea, and Milton that this is the Congressional District that has been hardest hit by the pandemic? Certainly not. Because of those pre-existing structural racism comorbidities because of policy choices, because of budget choices, because of underinvestment, because of divestment, I knew that this district would be the hardest hit. So the stretch of McGrath Highway that passes within the yards of the East Somerville and Mystic Avenue communities, which is characterized as environmental justice communities according to the Commonwealth's definition, it's an incredible burden of living next to an interstate highway, among other environmental hazards. Again, as Rep. Conley spoke to, which can be clearly seen through a heat map of asthma rates and other respiratory diseases. So this is tragically a continuation of the existing trend in the entire Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, where communities of color, minoritized and marginalized communities, disproportionately bear the burden of critical regional infrastructure. It is no coincidence, if you follow I-93 into Boston, you'll find that other communities like Chinatown, that border the highway, also have some of the highest asthma rates in the Commonwealth. And in communities like Chelsea, we were forced to fight for a permanent air quality monitor, which we were successful in securing to begin to protect these communities from future injustices. Again, oppression is intersectional. Justice must be too. Our destinies are tied. And the need is clear. This section of McGrath Highway deserves separated and protected bike lanes, as well as sound and ultra-fine particulate barriers. And I'm going to continue to fight for those investments as a part of my negotiations putting forward during these transportation and infrastructure negotiations. So just know that. And again, I want to extend my gratitude to this Somerville delegation. Let me know in fact, y'all, I almost moved to Somerville. Okay? Many years ago. And I still, it was never my home, but I feel like it is. Um, so I thank the Somerville delegation for fighting for these investments to be included in the recent Massachusetts Transportation Bond Bill. And again, it is my honor to do this work in solidarity and in partnership with all of you. And I know we have gone long, and I know it was hot, and I know this gravel is uncomfortable, but we should stay uncomfortable so that we do not grow complacent in our organizing until transit and environmental justice is realized for every community. All right. Tony, um, listen, this has been uh, my brother in arms on so many social justice issues, uh, someone who unapologetically affirmed that black lives mattered before it was popular, someone who worked closely with me to ban racist facial recognition technology, to reform the state's liquor license laws, and for our creative economy and for arts advocacy. I thank him for his partnership, for his lifetime of service, and it is my honor now to invite him to the podium. Mayor Curry Tony. Thank you, Congresswoman. I gotta tell you, 
I haven't seen just about all of you for over a year. It's good to be amongst you. It really is. Thank you for what you're doing. I am, um, I've had the honor and privilege, if you don't know me, I'm Joe Curtis, joining the mayor. I grew up the street on Prospect Hill where my mother still lives. I lived on Vermont Ave, two houses down from the highway. I didn't need a traffic report in the morning. I just opened up the window and saw the traffic queued up. I am in that statistic of respiratory illness. McGrath Highway was my, one of my many urban playgrounds, riding my bike when I walked to East Somerville to what is now the Capilano School, then Glen Park to play Somerville Little League with Donnie, your family and others down here. My mother would pray that I wouldn't go by myself, that I'd look both ways, um, because these are not accidents. These pedestrian crashes that are totally preventable have been happening for generations. I remember when my friend Tommy's grandmother was run over and killed in some of the lab. I remember when my friend's brother on my street was hit on his big wheel, survived. I remember when my friend's daughter was hit uh, about 20 years ago before I became here on the other side, right near the intersection, just watched launch 30 feet in the air, survived with their legs broken. It's been going on for a long time. We keep certainly show Kevin, Mac, and others in our thoughts and prayers. Let's not let those preventable losses and those lives be forsaken. Um, there's a sign here that we've been shot in for a long time. It says, prioritize people over cars. This community has known that for a long time. We've always said, you've always been active to say that if you plan a city for cars, that's what you're going to get. That's what the state did. Your activism, and I know you know the value of that. I want to capitalize on what's been said here. Going back to the tradition, Barbara, your family, your mother, Vera, and so many others who stood in front of those bulldozers to try to stop 93 to make sure the inner belt, along with other activists and advocates in the region, did not happen, even when politicians sold you down the river, and they did. We could have stopped the superstructure, and we let it happen. But like many urban communities around the world, our community is still battling the effects of the mid-century shift to car-eccentric infrastructure. And again, although so many of you battled that going back to the 60s, some of couldn't stop the I-93. The east uh, uh, overpass to the city. Remember, hundreds of homes were taken from Ten Hills and Mystic Ave, uprooted. Uprooted. People were displaced. The consequences of that shift, as we know, are still with us today. Pedestrians are either cut off from certain neighborhoods or have to risk safety to get them. And these some of our residents and others in these environmental justice neighborhoods are subjected to the exhaust from the thousands of cars that pass on I-93 and in this roadway daily. Now, you have all, along with other some of the residents, have worked tirelessly to advocate and be active to mitigate these harms. And you've helped me and others accomplish great successes with our state partners, and many of them want to be partners. But there is not a will at the highest office and agencies that do this. This is not a question of money today. Your activism and advocacy to grow assembly and all the other investments that's coming here is pouring billions into the state coffers. They have the money. They have the money. And they can do this. They just don't want to. There are major safety and equity challenges here. You heard what Conley talked about. If you overlay the environmental justice zones, along with who lives in public and subsidized housing, with the COVID map, I'll tell you who was getting sick and dying. I got 86 calls for the people that have died in this city. They're the ones who couldn't get on a public transportation because they had no option. They're the ones who didn't work the white collar jobs, so they couldn't work virtually. They're the ones who had to get on the public transit system that they were cutting service on to go to Fenway Park in the Hines. It took over an hour to wait to get a vaccine when they abandoned our public local health infrastructure. So the pandemic has put a shining bright light in the inequities of the whole system, not just the brick and mortars. But again, I want to remind us all that these are system failures that touch every facet of our lives. We know, and it's been said, if someone can't get safety to their job, to school, the grocery store, and we don't have food deserts because we live miles apart, we're only 4.1 square miles. They were built by man, right here. Right here. These accidents, we said were going to happen. Not like these deaths, these crashes, and more will come. We told them that. That's been our fear from the beginning. And we've been ignored. Because none of this is really equitable, accessible to everyone in our community. And these systems are, as a white, privileged, elected official, son of Italian immigrants, working class, I will say it loud and clear, they are rooted in historic racism, anti-urban bias, intentional exclusion of low and moderate income and poor people that lived here going back decades. 
So Matt and others and Mike, when we talk about the sound barriers, let's just be clear. I've gone by those communities on the pipe. They're ingrained, nice artistry on, on the materials. Fine wood. We've asked for slabs of concrete. Just give it to us. Ignore it. Ignore it for decades. This has been intentional and deliberate ignorance. And really, what people matter to them. Because if those deaths during COVID were happening in Wellesley and Swampscott, I'll tell you what, they'd be doing a damn hell of a lot more during the pandemic. But they weren't. If the people were dying of crashes that were preventable on their bicycles or crossing the street in those communities, you bet there'd be more action. But we can heal those scars, and your work will do it. I've been married now, it's my 18 year, the best job I ever have. And someone asked me in an interview last week, what's the thing you look forward most after COVID? It's being with all of you, being with all of you. When we have to climb that ladder of bureaucracy to go fight for the Green Line extension, to sit what they're legally required to do, for the arms line stuff, thank you, Ellen, and the advocacy, to say we want to cut off a, a lane in each direction to make East Broadway safe, to bring a dedicated bus and all the other work you've been fighting for. You know what makes my job easier? 81,000 activists out of their mind willing to fight. Never have to look over my shoulder. Never have to. Do not, do not underestimate that power. The proof is what you see before your eyes. Everything we've accomplished has been the product of everyone's hands. Everything we will accomplish will be that fight. I look forward to being with you well beyond after our mayor because there's a long way to go. I have an offer from Master before I, I, I introduce one of my favorite people here. Take care of that mess you gave us 70 years ago. We don't need it. Fix the intersection. But I'll tell you what, McCarthy overpass is going to come down because this community said it's going to come down. Every city congressman should have control of the roadways in this city. This should not be a state-controlled roadway. Give it back to us, I'll tell you what will happen. We'll reduce the lanes of traffic. We'll put in the dedicated bus lane that I would take. We'll do it right now. And I'll tell you, I am proud to introduce, she represents a cohort of activism and advocacy that's been well-rooted in our community's DNA. She understands what equity means and fights for all of us. I've leaned on her and so many of you in fighting for this community's values. Uh, Ellen Reisner lives in East Somerville. She is the president of Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership. She is a champion for all of us. Please welcome Ellen. Hi, everybody. This is a very tough act to follow, I have to say. So please bear with me. My name is Ellen Reisner. I've lived in East Somerville for 21 years. And for the last 15 years, I've worked with other community partners and academic researchers to study the air pollution and noise pollution that my neighbors are subject to every day, every night. And I really appreciate being able to speak today because I want to just point out, as has been said before, that the state has totally ignored pedestrian safety and the dangerous health impacts to residents from excessive exposure to air and noise pollution. And since conceiving this in the construction of I-93 um, in the 1970s, the state ignored the impact of this transportation infrastructure for over 50 years, and, and it's gotten worse because we have more traffic, more, more pedestrians, more bicycles, and the state just doesn't do anything. I want to acknowledge my, my neighbors over here, Barbara Cassesso, Dolores Lapiana, and other families who were fighting against I-93 for years. And they were my inspiration. Um, you know, it, it, it's just unconscionable what has happened in this community because of, because of the dangerous situation. Um, I want to just point out something ironic. In 2008, a group of us tried to get increased crossing time here at this intersection, and we got five seconds extra <laughs> to cross six lanes of traffic. We also asked them to replace the walk sign, which happens to be on an island that you have to go across a right on red uh, turn, and they said, no, we don't have enough money for that. Well, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I, I personally just 
I mean, I don't know what to say anymore. It's just, it's just ridiculous. And I'm so grateful to all of you for being here and, and, and participating in this because this is a fight we have to win. It absolutely is. We have to ask, we have to say that MassDOT must stop ignoring the lives of our residents and not just replace infrastructure. That's all they seem to care about. They have to accelerate the work to do the improvements. They need to create the crosswalk over here where poor Mr. Mack died. They need to enact the calming measures. And, and what is my passion is addressing the air and the noise pollution. If you live near on the State's Avenue, it's noisy all the time, except for when the traffic is stopped up, you know, when it's back to back, and that's when the pollution is really bad. So they have a choice. More pollution, more noise. We need to do something about that. Sound barriers will help with both. And we have to fight for this. It is really important. We know, we've done the research. We know that those can help. We can't, and MassDOT floated an idea of putting um, Jersey barriers with metal on top of them. They said, they called them snow, um, sound barriers. Those aren't sound barriers. Those are Jersey barriers with a three foot wall on them. And we're not gonna accept snow, snow fences for barriers. So I just wanna say that we continue to do research on the air pollution. Some of my colleagues are here today. I hope people will support that work. And I know that people will ad continue to advocate for pedestrian and bike safety in our community. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, make sure you show up June 1st and June 8th to call for MassDOT to take action. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, our state and Diana Presley, our state representative and Diana Presley for coming up. Sign up petition if you haven't. Master needs a grand rocket.